Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Kama Daf Tzadidalid. Today's stuff is sponsored by Harriet Hartman, loving memory of Uri, Uri El Ben Ami, who passed away last Thursday. He's a Chrome with a strong Zionist with a lifetime of stories to tell. He was the husband of my dear friend, Henrietta Ben Ami. Okay, we're going to get started. Okay, we started this interesting topic about Shinoi, which is a basic topic that comes up in many other sugyo, which is why this is exactly how we're going to start our daf today which is Abaye coming and saying that this concept of whether or not, and what he's going to prove is that this concept that a Shinoi is not Kone, okay? He calls it Shinoi bin Komo Med, which basically means the concept we're discussing today is if I change an object, does that mean I can acquire it by changing it? Or it doesn't always mean, in, in not all the cases, is it acquiring it? Does it mean that it's now not anymore what it originally was? And therefore, there's almost no connection between the item and its and its past, so to speak. Um, or do we not say that? So our Mishnah seemed to be based on the fact that Shino is Kone. If I steal something and it's no longer the same as it was when I stole it, then this concept that the Torah says I have to return the stolen item no longer applies. Now, of course, I need to return the value. But the question is, right, the, the Mishnah seems to be saying I have to return it based on the value of what it was valued at when I stole it. But the fact that now, right, I don't necessarily have to return the actual item. And that's what we learned so far. And now we had a whole debate about what kind of changes, changes it, doesn't change it, right? We, we had a whole debate about that yesterday, whitening the wool, this and that. And we got into this whole concept of Rishida Gez, which is a totally different issue. Um, although maybe when we get to it later, it will be quoted again. We'll go a little more in depth about how connected is it to stealing or not, but we'll get to that later. So the first thing we're going to start with is the statement of Abai at the bottom of Radaf. Abai says, we mentioned this other approach, and he says, or this other opinion of Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda, the quote of Rabbi Shimon, is saying that really, right, theoretically what he was saying is Shinoi is not Koned because if the color is going to go back to what it was, right, again, it really depends how you define it, but even if you don't say it that way, it sounds like he's basically saying if you color something, you color the wool, it doesn't change it, and you're still liable for bringing the shearings to the Kohen. So Amar Abaye, at the bottom of Tzadik Gimel but we'll just go back a little bit. Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda, Beit Shammai, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, and Rabbi Yishmael, who we're going to see all of them now. Kulu sviralu shinoi bimkomo omed, which in other words is shinoi eno kone. That a shinoi keeps the object as it was before. It doesn't change anything. Okay, so now we're going to see one by one. So Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar was the one who basically said in the name of Rabbi Shimon that um, if you were shearing the sheep and you colored some of them, then you're no longer chayav and rishit against because you colored it, it's no longer shearings. Okay, it's called something else once it's dyed. So he thinks that that's not true. He says, even if you colored it, you still are obligated. He goes against Tanakama because he doesn't view a shinoi as being significant. Beit Shammai, we said, was the, the, the gift for the prostitute. A prostitute gets a gift. You can't use that as a sacrifice. But if she gets raw materials that she turns into something else, like wheat that she turns into bread, or, or actually just flour even, or olives she turns into olive oil, or grapes she turns into wine, you can then bring that for something on the altar. Okay, that's what, that's what Beit Hall says, because it's a shinoi. Beit Shammai says, no way, no how. Because, again, the fact that she changes it doesn't really change anything. So now we're going to go to, we're going to start from where we ended up yesterday, which is the top of Tzadu Dalev and Amr Aleph on the second line. My time in the Beit Shammai. Why does he hold that this is still forbidden? And this is, these are draw show, we're going to have a ping pong back and forth between him and Beit Hillel about what their proof is and the pasuk and how they each learn the drasha, how does he deal with the other side. My time in debate, Shammai, Amar Ka Gam Shnehem. If you remember, the Pusik says, don't bring an Ednan Zona or Mechir Kelev, the money you got for the sale of a dog, to Beit Hashem Lokecha. You can't use that money or that animal or that gift or whatever it is to bring into something on the altar. Ki Tovat Hashem Lokecha, because it's despicable to God, Gam Shnehem. Also, both of these now, also both of these is redundant. You could just say Shnehem. Okay, so why do you say Gam? He says that comes to include something additional. What does it include? If you change the item, if you change the item, it doesn't matter. You still can't bring. 
And Hill says, what are you talking about? It says shnehem. Why does it add the hem at the end? Them, them meaning them and not. If you change them, it has to be the original item and not an item that was changed. Once it's changed, you can bring it on the altar. But what are you going to do with that hem? That means them and not their offspring. You've given a, a gift of an animal to a prostitute and that animal has an offspring. That can go on the altar, but not the animal, not the original animal itself, and not if it was changed either. Who bit Hillel? So what do where what do they do with Vladotehem? Where do they get it from? If Haim for Beit Hillel is coming to tell you, and even if they were changed, well, right, I'm sorry, Haim below Shinuihem. Sorry, them and not their Shinui. If you changed it, you actually can bring it. So what how does he learn the Vladot? Well, Tartishmat Mina, Haim below Shunehem, Haim below Vladotehem. Ham comes to exclude both those things, okay? Not if he changed it, not their offspring. Now we're left with one last question. Beit Hillel, Nami Haftiv Gam. Well, what does he do with, right? We dealt with what does Beit Shammai do with Beit Hillel's drasha? But what does Beit Hillel do with Beit Shammai's drasha of Gam? We didn't have any need for the word Gam according to Beit Hillel because Beit Hillel is excluding things. Gam would be coming to include something. So they actually say that Gam the Beit Hillel Kasha. This is the exact back and forth that we saw the last time we quoted the Suga not so long ago. So that's what we're left. With. So in the end, what do we see basically though? Beit Shammai, at least the way we're understanding it now, holds like the other opinion we saw from Hashem and Ben Yehuda, that a Shinoi is not really significant. It doesn't change anything really. Even if you change the item, you still can't bring it on the, on the altar. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov Mahi. So what's his opinion? Ditanya. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov Omeo. Okay, so just notice the first two, the first one had to do with Rashid Age, it's a different topic. The second one had to do with Etna and Zona, a different topic. Now we're back to theft and stealing. Elizabeth ben Yaakov says, You steal a se'ah's worth of wheat. Now what changed more than that, right? You took it, you ground it, you kneaded it, you made a dough out of it, and you baked it. Now it's bread. Oh, sorry, this isn't, uh, it's stealing, but it's not really our topic. I'm sorry, we're not yet back to our topic. This is, Stealing, but not in terms of returning it. This is a different issue. Okay. The real issue here is hafrashat chala. So now we actually learned this source also a long time ago. Um, and you now take chala from this dough. So you stole wheat, you turned it into dough. You want to now take hafrashat chala. So comes Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov and says, Kate sad How on earth can you make a blessing on this? Right and say Sheikh Sham said, right? How could you say God commanded me to to take challah from here? This is despicable. This is like sacrilegious. You basically stole something, and now you're making a blessing to God on it. God doesn't want to have anything to do with this. Al and this is we could quote a pasuk from Tehillim that says, Hashem, a botzea who makes a blessing, someone who's going to have bread and makes a blessing on it." is basically disgracing God. This is, right, disgusting. So here you have it. Even though I changed it, okay, so it's similar in the fact that it was a stolen item, but we're not talking about the returning of the stolen item. That's the next one. I got confused for a minute. But how dare I bless God about this, even though it's not the same thing. I'm blessing God on bread. I stole wheat. It's not the same thing. I did a shino, you could say. At this point, I acquired it. Of course, I have to return the money, well, the truth is, I guess this is really the same because what it's saying is, uh, you know, you could say the opposite, which is, of course, I have to return the money. But at this point, I, I have ownership on this item. So it's mine. It's not like it's a despicable thing. Again, still say it. it's Miss Rabab Avera, right? This isn't appropriate, but okay. So that's that's this topic. So it relates, and it's the same kind of concept, but not to the element of theft that we've been talking about, about returning. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar Mahi. Here, this is going to be more directly related. Ditanya. Okay, so bright to start off saying this is the rule Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar stated. Anything that the that the gazlan um, uh, improved the value of something, okay, so stole an animal, fattened it up. Well, the thief, he has the upper hand. So what does that mean? Or she has the upper hand. It means if I steal, I fan up the animal and I go to return you the animal, I can demand back some money for what I increased the value of this animal from what it was. 
רצה נוטל שפחו, okay, so if I want, I can demand back the additional benefit, uh, the additional appreciation, רצה אומר לו הרי שלך לפניך, and if I want, I can say here, take your animal as is. That's a very strange line. Why would I do that? Why would I? This is basically giving me two choices. I took an animal that was worth 100. I appreciated its value to 120. Now I give it back to you. I can either demand the 20 back or I can just give you the whole 120. Why would I ever want to do that? Something doesn't make sense of the source. And right? if I had a choice of getting back 20 or not getting back anything, of course, I'm going to choose the option of getting back 20. So something doesn't make sense with that last part. My Kamar, what does it mean? Amar Rav Sheshet Hachi Kamar. Rav Sheshet explains what it means. The Braita first is talking about a case of Ishbicha, where it appreciates in value. No tell Shivcho. So I can get the appreciation in it when I go return it to you. I can say, give me back the extra 20. But Kichesh, if it went down, Kachash, if it went down in value, okay, if I took this animal and the animal got thinner, let's say, or, or you know, somehow depreciates in value, this is a, somehow. How is actually going to be a bit of a debate after, but let's just say it in general. It decreased in value, depreciated. Omer lo Why is that? So now you have our source. This is what we were looking for. The way Rav Sheshit explains the second part of Rav Shem Ben-Alazar is what we were looking for, which is if the animal depreciates in value, when I give it back to you, I could just give you back the animal, even though it's no longer the same animal as it was then. Right. Until now, we've been saying if I did a shino, something changed, right? like the animal had offspring. It wasn't even necessarily a change I did. So even if it's not my fault, but if the animal depreciates in value, normally we'd say, tough luck. I acquired the animal by doing this you know, because the shino happened. This change happened in the animal. I have to pay you the value at the time of the theft. But no, according to Rishim ben Alazar, I give you the animal as is. It's now, instead of being worth 100, it's now worth 80. I give you back this 80 value, the animal valued at 80. Why? Because she knew it. It's the same item. Just because it changed doesn't mean anything. So the Gemara says, if she knew it, well, then if we go by, what did this say? This said, I always have as the thief the upper hand, which is a little bit crazy. We're going to see why now, why this is. But that means if it goes up in value, I can demand more. If it goes down in value, you take the loss. No matter what, it's it's on my side. But if we hold that Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, which is what Abai is saying, by putting him in the same category, the same boat as all these other people, is that he holds Shinoi doesn't change anything. If Shinoi doesn't change anything, right? Meaning a change isn't really doesn't make a difference. Well, then a filu hishbiachnami. Even if the animal got went up in value, appreciated in value, I should still have to give you the animal as it is now. I don't acquire the extra value. To which they answer, I do. Why is that? That's because we want to encourage me to repent. And this is a topic we're going to talk about a lot more today. We're going to see how far the rabbis went to really encourage repentance. And I want already to start thinking about it. Why was it so important for them to, that like they would bend halacha, so to speak, right? Theoretically, if you hold, if the animal increases in value, I should have to give you the animal as is, add it in, as at its increased value. So be because we want to encourage me to repent, we're going to give me that extra back. And I just have to return to you what it was valued at, at the time of the theft. Now, why is it so important for them? In general, we want people to do tshuva, but this is going a little bit far at the loss of somebody else. So that's what you really have to think about. You're going to lose out if I stole from you and I give you back something now, right? If we go like this takanada shavin, that I don't have to, and we're going to see how far we even take this. But in the end, the reason is because you want to prevent further theft. If we leave thieves without giving them a way, a door to do tshuva, to repent, they're going to keep stealing. That's the problem. And then they're going to take from other people more and more and more, and it's going to cause huge losses. And we all know how hard it is to retrieve stolen items. So in the end, it's going to be a future much greater loss. So for that, you, as the one who was stolen from, might have to sustain a bit of a loss, but, okay, even maybe a lot more than a bit of a loss, which we'll see at the end of today's talk, but it's for the better good, okay? It's almost like a tikkun olam, as we, as, you know, we learned about in Gitin. In order to, to let people stop doing this, in order to stop preventing more problems, uh, start stop preventing 
you know, more issues, uh, start preventing more issues, we want to basically allow a bit of a loss now for the future good. Okay, last opinion. Rabbi Yishmael Mahi, the fifth person who says the same thing as all the others. Ditanya, mitzvah pe'al aflish minakama. Now we're talking about another totally different issue, leaving the corner of the field to the poor people. You're supposed to leave one sixtieth of your field. You leave it minakama. That means while all the grain is still standing or whatever's in the field, before you do the, the harvesting, the cutting, all that. So that's when you leave it. And then you just leave it there. It's half care. Okay, it's not obligated in any of the other mitzvot. You just leave it for the poor. It's ownerless. They take it. They don't have to do truma masrot, any of that stuff. Lo if kama, what if you forgot and you've cut your whole field and now you have piled bundles of wheat? Mafrish mina omarim. So you leave some of the bundles there. Lo if marim, if you forgot to do it then, mafrish mina kli. Well, then the next stage is the piling it up. You leave part of the pile. Ad shalomarhu. This is all until you finish your pile. Usually they would flatten out the top of the pile. That would be what we call Gemar Malacha. From the moment you do Gemar Malacha, now your pile is liable in Trumona Masla. Until then, there was no obligation yet for Trumona Masla. Until you put in a pile, it's not obligated. Once you do that, Mercho, you already flatten out the pile, call Gemar Malacha, you're liable in Trumona Masra. You still have to leave it for the poor, but what? You have to first take Trumona Masra on everything. You can't say, oh, I'll leave them a pile and let them deal with the Maser. That's not fair to the poor people. They're going to lose out. Take the maser and then leave one sixtieth for the poor. So maser v'notenlo. So you have to do the maser, take the tithes, and then leave the leave some for the poor. But that's it. If you bring it inside, then it doesn't say this, but the obvious it's going to be obvious from the next opinion. If you bring it inside and you grind it and you make flour and you make a dough and you bake it and you now have bread and you didn't give pea to the poor people, it's too late. Basically, you don't have to anymore because it's already not the same item as it was outside. Okay, it's not grains, right? Raw grains, you've turned it into something else. He says, I don't care that you changed it, that it's not the same thing. You have to separate for the poor people from the dough. So there you again see the same opinion. Shinoi doesn't change anything. So that's Abai with his five opinions. Now, there's one big issue here, which is what? We said that one of the five was Beit Shammai. So now we have a problem because we don't hold like Beit Shammai. So now we have all these Tanaim. Okay, Amale Rapapa Abai Rapapa says to Abai, what happened here? All these Tanaim hold like Beit Shammai? That makes no sense. They ignore Beit Hillel and they hold like Beit Shammai? How could that possibly be? So we're going to have two answers to this question. Amale Abai answers him, Hachi Beit Shammai said it, but Beit Hillel doesn't agree, disagree with him. In other words, okay, now, what do you mean Beit Hillel disagreed? We saw Beit Hillel disagree. Well, if you remember, it was quoted in the name of Yosef, that we had one that said Asur, one that said Mutar, and then we said, oh, the one who says Asur must be Beit Shammai, the one who says Mutar must be Beit Hillel. Okay, but I have a different approach to this. I don't think they all disagree with Beit Shammai. I think Ben Hillel agreed with Beit Shammai. It wasn't a, 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 an issue that was debated, debated between them. This happens, by the way, with a lot of times we've seen Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel, and we have one time of opinion that they didn't disagree about this, and one time they said they did disagree. It's very common. They were earlier, and there were debates about you know what exactly they disagreed about. He says, I actually think this is the mainstream opinion, Beit Shammai. Okay? Then you have to worry why all these other people disagree. But it's, it wasn't a nukudah machloga between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel. It could be later. It became a debate. But they didn't debate it. That's not an issue. That's one possible answer. But the second answer here is a more interesting answer, I think, which is Amar Rava. Rava said, and he's going to knock out everything that Abayi said. Abayi said, these five people, it's all based on the exact same logic. Okay? Even though each one was kind of a totally different situation they were discussing and a different issue. But they all boil down to, and that's the that's the the nature of this type of statement of Abaye, which is said a lot of times in the Gemara, where people will will take you know, this opinion, that opinion, that opinion, and say, oh, these are all really one and the same, even though they're talking about totally different issues, but the, the idea behind them is all the same. Comes Rav and he says, you're totally wrong. He says, right, surprisingly, Rav disagrees with Abaye. He says, Mimai, what, what are you talking about? I'm a Rav, Mimai, what do you, what do you mean? Dilma, and now he's going to go one by one. 
and say, maybe each one only said it in their particular situation. And this isn't a broad generalization that we can make about everything. Each one had a unique reason why they said it in that case. So let's go one by one. Now that was, that was the tricky part there. That source, the way we explained it yesterday at the end of class was that the reason why Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda says, at least one of the explanations we gave was that the reason why he differentiates between Seva there and Seva somewhere else. Now he didn't, right? But one of the questions was if he says it's Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon says elsewhere that Libun is, and Seva is more than Libun, and that makes a Shinoi. Well, it depends what kind of Seva. This was a Seva that could be undone. And that's why it wasn't really a Shinoi. It was a mild Shinoi. You changed it by coloring it, but it, the color can come out, right? If you use this Tzvon, which would get it out. And let's go to Beit Shammai. When Beit Shammai was talking about an Etnan, why did he say you can't bring it, even though there was a Shinoi, which normally would say this isn't the same item. This is an easy one. That is bringing something on the altar. We're going to be super stringent about it. We're going to say, even though normally Shinoi turns it into something else, but in the case of putting something on the altar, if it had anything to do with a prostitute, you know, we're going to stay far away from it. Maybe not anything, because remember, the, the offspring is okay, but that animal itself, no way, no how, or, you know, the, the grapes, no. You can turn them into wine, it doesn't matter. You still can't bring them. Number three, when it came to the bracha on the chala, which would be kind of similar, I saw someone writing in the chat about it, right? This is a mitzvah that comes about on account of a sin. We don't do a mitzvah. Right, that comes out of an affair. You can't bless God on something that you stole. So again, we're going to be more strict about it because it's a different topic, right? That's why I said it's the same topic, but it's different. It has to do with stealing. It has to do with shinoi and stealing, but it has to do with not about what you're returning to the person, but about the, making a blessing to God on it. But Adkan, Lokam, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. Now this one really has to do with stealing. This was about if it gets weakened, the animal's less in value, you can return the the less value, even though it's different, right? Well, the easy way to answer this is, Rabbi says, That's a weakening that will go back to itself. Let's say the animal didn't eat well for a week, so they're weaker now and they, they're thinner. But a week of giving the animal some food, they'll return back to their original strength. And as we're talking about some sort of weakening that is not irreversible, basically. And then, again, you're going to distinguish between irreversible change. It's the same, by the way, as the, as the coloring. It's the same idea that we said there. Coloring that's irreversible is a real change. Coloring that's reversible is not. And the final one. Pe'a is a whole different story. Because why? We're going to be extra strict about pe'a and make you... Give the corner of your, you know, a portion of your produce, even if you've turned it already into bread, because mishum dechtiv ta'azov yatera. There's two psukim in the Torah that say the exact same thing about leaving things to poor people. Okay, one is Vayikra 19.10, and one is Vayikra 23.22. So in both those places, it says, lager, la'aniva lager ta'azov otam. Okay, both say the exact same wording. Why would you say the same thing twice? To tell you, you have to leave it, no matter what, even if you change. The chi tema, now they say, wait a minute. You might say, if there's this drasha here by the poor person, that even if you changed it, it's still going to be ligmar mine. Well, maybe that should be the paradigm for everything else. Maybe there's a drasha, and then we use that as our paradigm. And then we say, this goes right all the, all over. To which they say, no, because this is a gift to poor people that is held in a different category. How do we know this? Well, they're going to say, by Rabbi Yonatan. As Rabbi Yonatan asked, okay, he wasn't sure, but basically we're saying because there was this, what we prove from here is at least there was a someone who was thinking that perhaps it's different. And then they're going to say, and, and we think it's different. So what was his question? Dibai Rabbi Yonatan, my time is Rabbi Ishmael. Why did Rabbi Ishmael say what he said? Is it Mishum de Kasabar Shinoi no Kone? Is this a general philosophy of his that change doesn't really do anything? Oh, he really does think that changing something does make it acquired by the person, like in theft. 
I change it, it becomes mine. And again, I have to return it at its original value. Okay, so you said, and maybe here it's different because it says Tazov twice, and then we're going to view the poor person as a unique hala. Okay, so this just basically gave us strength to say, even though he kind of threw up both his options, but they say, you see here, he thought it. So that that's why Rava is basically going to say, this is just by the poor people, the same way that Rabbi Yonatan thought it, Rava kind of held it. Now we're going to ask some questions about this Trashav Ta'asof. Now, if you go with a different approach, not agreeing with Rav, and thinking that really Rabbi Ishmael holds, Shino is not Kone. Then what are you going to do with Tazov Yitera de Katav Rahman Alamali? Then why do you have this extra Tazov? Okay, in other words, now we're stuck if we don't, because first he suggested it's a unique halacha and gave a proof. Now we're going to say, well, if you don't hold that way, then what do you do with the extra Tazov? Why does it say it twice? And Vitula Rabbanan, and if you're the rabbis, forget about within Rabbi Ishmael, we have two different approaches. Is this a general thing or is it just by the by Pe'ah? If you don't hold by him at all and you're the rabbis who disagree and think that you're not liable and pay, you don't have to pay give the Pe'ah anymore, then what does he do with the Tazo? So we have this double type question, either according to one understanding of Rabbi Ishmael or according to any understanding of the rabbis. What on earth do we do with the Tazov? Why is that extra there? So they have a different drasha here. It's needed for the following bread. If you um, say my vineyard is hefker, you know, when you make your vineyard hefker, it's no longer right. Anyone can take it. Okay. And you're no longer liable for, you don't uh, feel this hefker that's ownerless. You don't have to take the masa. So if I, one afternoon, say my whole vineyard is have care. Anyone who wants to can come and take whatever they want. And then in the morning, I wake up and I say, and I start working my field, basically saying, I'm now acquiring it back and it's all mine. But I made it have care. So what's my halacha now? Well, now that I re, I took back ownership, I'm liable to give all those gifts to the poor, but paturmina masir, but I'm exempt from masir. So what the extra ta'azov is saying, gifts for the poor you still have to take. If I do this crazy situation where I make it ownerless and then accept, you know, buy it, kind of acquire it all back the next morning. But I have exempted myself from the masir, which isn't for poor people, right? That goes to the Levites. I mean, you could say they're a little poor because they don't have necessarily their own fields. We need to support them. But in any case, that's not the same as the poor people. The poor people that had this double ta'azo, which meant even if I made it ownerless and then took it back, I would still have to give the gifts to the poor. And then that would be the way to explain ta'azo if you don't go by that approach. Okay, so what have we done so far today? In a very simple, quick review, Abaye took five opinions about five different things, put them all together and said, they all say shinoi bimkomo omed, which in other words means shino eno kone. Changing an item doesn't mean it's acquired. We raised a question and said, well, then what? They all hold like Beit Shammai? So Abai himself answered, well, I don't think the Beit Shammai Beit Hill disagreed about that. And then you have no problem. Rada says as an answer, what do you mean? I think these five are each unique halachot. Each one had its own, his own unique reason for saying what he said. And it doesn't build a paradigm for anything else. These aren't all five of the same thing. They're not part of this Shino Eno Kone. Really, they all hold. Shino is, does cause you to be the owner of the item. And in theory, would either these were minor shinuyim or it had to do with God, Gavoah, the temple, or the blessing where we're going to treat it more severely, or the one Rabbi Ishmael, where we said it's a unique halacha by poor people because of a drasha on the pasu. Okay, and that's how, that's what we did till now. Now we're going to bring two contradictions, one within the words of Shmuel and one within Rabbi Yochanan. About these issues. So Amar Rav Yehuda Amar Shmuel Halacha Ter Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazar. So Rav Yehuda now quotes Shmuel as holding like Rabbi Shimon Ben Elazar. Now who is he? You have to remember. He was the one who said that if it goes up in value, you get to take the appreciated value, but if it goes down in value, you can just return the animal and loss is on the owner. So now the Gemara is going to ask, Umi Amar Shmuel Hachi. Did Shmuel really say this? Now again. 
This really means, taking it literally, that Shinoi, okay, if we take it, there's two ways of reading it. One is like Abai, one is like Rava. According to Abai, Shinoi doesn't change anything. According to Rava, it was a case of a change that is reversible, right? Reversible, not irreversible, right? A reversible change. So now let's see. So this is actually has to do with something we learned called Pachat Nevela, if you remember, and the, the Nevela in general. If my ox damages your ox and kills your ox, and your ox was valued at 100 originally, and now it's dead, the Nevela, the dead, the carcass is worth 40. So what happens, if you remember, what happens in Nizikim, and that they're going to say happens in Nizikim, but it's not going to be true for theft. You get to keep the dead animal, the carcass, which is worth 40. We evaluate its value. We assess that it's 40. I have to now pay you the 60. Okay, let's say it was Shor Muad and I pay you full damages or whatever it was, it was Shane, it doesn't matter. I now pay you the the full value, okay, it would probably be a shormua, that's why I killed you. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but I pay you the, the 60 now, the difference, but you get the dead animal goes back to you. Now, Shmuel says, we don't do this shamim, we don't evaluate and estimate what the dead animal is worth if I depreciated the animal by killing it, let's say, right? I stole your animal, then it died, okay? Whether I killed it or it died on its own, it doesn't matter. We don't do a shuma. We don't evaluate what's the carcass worth. I'm giving you back the carcass and now I have to pay you the difference. No. What do we do? We say, I stole the animal. It was worth 100. I pay you 100. And I'm stuck with the carcass. Okay, we don't give it back to you. The only time we do that is Nizik. So now, according to this, it went down in value and I have to give you Hishad Gzela. So if Shmuel says, Rabbi Shimon ben Al-Azhar, that if it went down in value, I can just give you back the animal as it is. Why can't I just give you back the dead carcass? Right? But we don't say that. So Bishlam al Rava, according to Rava, if we go back to the way Rava explained Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, it's very simple. Because what did Rava say? We're talking about a difference of the animal, let's say, losing some weight, and it'll gain the weight back. That's reversible damages. Now, obviously, if the animal's dead, that's irreversible. So these don't contradict at all. So Bishlam al Rabbi Damar ki kam Rabbi Shem ben Lazar hatam behakasha dehadar lo right if he says there it was reversible damage lo kasha it's not difficult at all ki kam Rabbi Halachak Rabbi Shem ben Lazar deshina bum kamo med bakasha dehadar there he said give the animal back as is because the animal will get back its original strength. The ki kam Rabbi Shmuel hatam ein shamin lo leganav lo legazan ela the nizakin that's clearly bakasha de lo hadar because the animal's dead it's irreversible damages then he wouldn't say. So that makes sense. But El Abai, but according to Abai, who said, Kikamar Rabbi Shimon, Bakasha de Lohadar Kamar, Abai viewed this as Shinoi doesn't change anything, even though it's a real change. So then, basically, Shmuel will be holding Shinoi doesn't change anything. And in the other case, Shinoi does change. So because you have to give back the value of the animal originally if the animal dies. So, Maikil Amemar, how are we going to explain it? To which we're going to say, Abai Manehafi. Abai is going to read the statement of Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Shmuel differently. And then he just changes it entirely and that resolves the problem. Instead of the fact that he said, Halakha, Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, we pasca like Rabbi Shem ben Lazar. Actually, he said, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Amar Shmuel, Amru Halakha, Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, Vilelo Sfirale. They say, people say we hold like Rabbi Shem ben Lazar, but I don't agree with them. And then that resolves it because he actually said the opposite of what he said. And that is the only way we can really resolve it according to Abai. Yeah, you see the faces. It's a bit of a, an interesting switch. Okay, next. Amar Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, Amar Rabbi Yochanan. Okay, Rabbi Chia Bar Abba says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Dvar Torah, according to Torah law, okay, we're now at the top of Amud Bet. There's a very big statement of Rabbi Yochanan. According to Torah law, we're going to make a difference between Torah law and what the rabbis instituted. Gzela hanishtane chozeret behineh. If something was stolen, it goes back as is, okay? Meaning, Shinoi doesn't change anything, okay? Shinemao, and it's very obvious. What does it say in the Torah? What do you have to do if you steal? Veheshiv etagzela asher gazal. Mikomakom, you have to return the stolen item. Sounds like you have to return it no matter what. You turned it into a this, you changed it, you did whatever you did with it. Sounds like by Torah law, you have to return it. Comes Rabbi Yochanan and continues, and he says, if you say, 
But our Mishnah doesn't say that because what did our Mishnah say? Let's go back to our Mishnah. It said you stole wood and you turned it into a vessel. You don't have to return that. All you have to do is return, right? You don't have to take apart your vessel, return it. No, you just have to return its value. So that's Mishum Takanat HaShavim. Ah, that's a rabbinic takana in order to encourage people to repent. So by Torah law, there's no such concept of Shinoi Kone, basically. Everything we've been learning, according to Rabbi Yochanan right now, he's going to say, that's not Torah law. It's all because of Takanat HaShavim, to which they're going to say, that doesn't really make sense, though. Because Umiyamah Rabbi Yochanan Hachi, how could Rabbi Yochanan have said that? Doesn't Rabbi Yochanan hold This is often we ask this type of question, Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan, there's an assumption that he holds like a Stam Mishnah. He holds like an unattributed Mishnah. If you have a, a Mishnah with Adam Achloket, he holds that way. Well, if he holds that way, we have a basic Mishnah that we learned already in Chulin about Reshid Gez, which has nothing to do with stealing, right? It just has to do with Ashinoi. What does it say there? It's not, no. If according to Rabbi Yochanan, by Torah law, Shinoi doesn't change anything, then we're going to have a problem with this Mishnah. If you didn't give it to the Kohen and then you colored it, you dyed it, you're exempt because it's no longer gez, it's no longer shearings, it's now dyed, dyed shearings. It's not the same thing, it's different. Now by Torah law, that's a Torah law that you have to give the first of your shearings. But it's no longer shearings because by Torah law you've changed it. There's no takanat shabim here, this isn't the thief. Okay, now, there's a big, big question about how to perceive the, the, the person who does this and what, what's going on here. And we'll learn this more when we get to Hulin and we learn this, but basically there's a machloket and the Rishonim about is the person, what was their motivation when they colored it? Were they trying to steal it? Were they trying to say, I want to keep this for myself? And some people say it's only if they were coloring it in order to keep it for themselves. And if they weren't trying to keep it for themselves, then we don't view that as, as a problem. Okay, and that maybe this is really connected with stealing. But this sugya seems to indicate not, which is the other approach in the Rishonim, which is, no, this has nothing to do with stealing. Even if I didn't intend to steal it, just by coloring it, I changed it into something else. It's no longer the first of my shearings because it's now colored, it's dyed, it's something else. And therefore I'd be exempt. Okay, and it's also different because I don't have to, not like that, I don't have to return the money to the Kohen also because there is no Kohen who specifically owed the money. This is what we call Mamon and Lotovin. There's no one who can claim it as their own. Some Kohen can come along, but who's to say I was going to give it to that Kohen? So it's also a bit of a problem to return the money. But that's just some concepts that they argue about, about Rashid Gaze. But the point here is, by Torah law, it seems clear that Shinoi is Kone. Otherwise, I'd have to bring it to the Kohen. So So we have a problem because Rabbi Yochanan said, by Torah law, it's not, she know he isn't Kone. And then we have this other statement, which sounds like, right, which is a Stam Mishnah, Rabbi Yochanan always holds by a Stam Mishnah, that says that she know he is Kone on a Torah level. And again, Rabbi Yochanan thinks that she know he is Kone for a Gazlan, but only because of, we want to encourage people to do tshuva. So this particular rabbi gave an answer to this. His name is Rabbi Yaakov. Lididi mefarshal eminei Rabbi Yochanan, Again, we go back to something we keep saying, which is, is it reversible or irreversible change? When it comes to irreversible change, like coloring, dyeing, now again, we had two types of dyeing, but when it comes to dyeing something, right, D-Y-E, dyeing, then we're going to basically say that's a serious change, even on a Torah level, Rabbi Yochanan is going to view that as a change. Then we go to category two, which is a change that can be undone. That's a change that Rabbi Yochanan said. Then really by Torah law, you have to, if it can be undone, like you took wood that was already sanded and, and ready and all you did was turn it into a vessel, but you can just undo it and put it back as a wooden board. Then you really don't have to return it. Then you really have to return it by Torah law. But the rabbis came and said to make it easier for you to repent, we're not going to make you do it. Okay, so what we did in this section was we brought a contradiction after we dealt with Abai, the five, and then Rava, who said each one is different. Then we went to this contradiction within Shmuel, which we resolved in two different ways, and which also related back to Abai and Rava in the two different ways they viewed things before. Um, and then we had this contradiction within Rabbi Yochanan, which we resolved as well. Now we're going to end the sugya with a Abraita and three sources that question this Abraita.
which is all about this Takana Shavim and the, the fact that we want to encourage as best as we can people to repent, which we already discussed before, because it's going to prevent future problems and you know down the road. Because if we don't let these guys repent, whether it's Gazlanim we're going to talk about and Milave Rebeat, people who who lend out money on interest. And these people are going to continue, continue always to do this. So to prevent it, we're going to make the door very open for them to come back and repent. Tanu Rabbanan, the Brighta says, Gazlanim Milave Rebeat Shehechziru Ein Mekablimehim. If I stole from you or I lent you money on interest and I come back to return it, you have to say, thanks, but no thanks. And if you take the money from me that I return to you, the rabbis are upset with you, okay? Because you're basically preventing people down the road from doing this. We want to make the path so easy that we don't even accept money from you. Now, this is a bit crazy. I mean, I stole from you, I don't have to return it. And what about all these cases where they did make thieves return money? So the commentaries say that we're going to distinguish between a case where you bring me to court because I stole something from you or I took interest from you and you want to get it back. Then I have to return it to you. But if I come on my own and I say, I feel bad that I stole this, then if I try to return it to you, you have to give it back to me. You can't take it from me. The rabbis basically said you can't do this, which is crazy to think. It says, Yeshiva Tagzei Lashir Gazal. But basically they say, yeah, you know, and, and soon we're going to say you should try to return it, but you can't accept, like I should try to return it, but you shouldn't accept it from me at all. And the rabbis will be upset with you if you do, because it's closing the door for few, in the future for other people to return. We want to make it so easy for them, again, to prevent future theft. I'm Rabbi Yochanan. So now Rabbi Yochanan is going to say, when did this whole thing come about? Be made Rabbi Nishnei Mishnasa. Hey, this was learned out in the time of Rabbi. They made this takana detan. There was a guy who wanted to do tshuva. He felt bad about all the things he had stolen in his life. You empty guy. Okay. Even your belt isn't yours. You're going to have to return every single item in our house. Everything we live on is stolen. And he didn't do tshuva. And obviously he probably stole more things, right? And, and that was a bad thing. Botasha and Bru is a response to that story. They said, And they basically made this takana. You can't take it from them. So now we're going to have three sources that seem to contradict this, which makes sense because it would be weird, right? This sounds like a strange halacha. If a man takes interest and then dies and leaves the, the extra rebeat, the interest, he never returned it to the original people. Well, the children now who inherited the father's estate knows there's X amount of rebeat there, interest that he took from people. They don't have to return. Sounds like, it sounds like the children don't need to, the heirs. But but if he were still alive, the father, he would have to return. So how do we explain that? Sounds like he doesn't have to return according to what we said. Well, they're going to say, no, no, no. Your inference is wrong. He also doesn't have to return it. Why were they talking about the children? Because they wanted to compare it to the next case in the bride to them. The reason why they said the children, because they wanted to get to the Lex Halacha, which was what? If the father took a cow as an interest payment or a talit as an interest payment. And everyone knows that talit belongs to so-and-so. That para belongs to so-and-so. And now within their estate, they have this so to speak, stolen property. It wasn't stolen, but it was taken against Talacha. So then they don't have to, then they have to return it because people will say, oh, that's the para that so-and-so stole and it'll be a disgrace to the father. So as a respect for the father, they return it. And that's how we resolve the problem. And that's why Taneresh and Nami Bidu. That's why the first case was mentioning the children because it had to do with the last case. But it, it doesn't mean... You don't infer from there the father didn't have to return it. The, fa uh, the father had to return it. The father didn't have to return it either. Okay, again, when you're talking about money, not object. The object is a different story. So now the Gemara just has a side question. This guy was a criminal. Why do they have to have respect for their father? Fascinating question, which we'll get to. We get to see the sugya inside in Sanhedrin. Do you really have to respect your parents if, they, if they're if they terrible people? If they did, you know, they, they were thieves, they stole, they took on interest. But, right, it says, Nasibam Chalota, or don't curse a prince among you. Why does it say Ba'amcha? He has to be doing Ma'asamcha. If he's a sinner, you, you can curse him. 
Well, Kedan Rav Pinchas, as Rav Pinchas said in a different situation, Ba'asa Tshuva, it's when he did Tshuva. Hachanami will say the same thing here. The father did Tshuva. Well, if the father did Tshuva, what's the problem? Yes, Tshuva, my Ba'ay Gabe, Ba'ay You should have had to return the item, right? The money. What was it doing there still, right? The the object, if it was a Pa'a or a Talit. Shalom speak Lachzir Ad Shemit. Okay, it must be a case where the father did Tshuva right before he died. Then he died. He didn't have time to return it. Then you have to return it. But if the father didn't do tshuva, they don't have to return it anyway. Anyway, that was an aside. The point is, they tried to infer from here that the father himself would have had to return the money. And that goes against what we said. But now we see it's not true. Tashma, second source. Even though they collected, so first they say, my gavu ika. Okay, the term gavu means to collect, like collect from a loan. It doesn't have anything to do with a theft. Either they took it or they didn't take it. It's not like they collected. So they answer, okay, what they really mean is, what they meant here is the interest, the usurers are the thieves. Okay, we mean thieves who are usurers. They're considered thieves. Now, what does it say here? Even though they collected, they have to return. Didn't we just say they don't have to return the money? They have to try to return, but you're not allowed to accept it from them. So they say, So then why do they try to, like, it seems it's all fictitious kind of thing. Well, let's say, okay. in other words, if you want to repent, you have to try to give the money back. Just the person's not supposed to accept it so that future in the future, people will want to do this again. It makes it a little bit tricky already. Tashma, last source, and we're going to do the same thing with this source. People who let their animals graze in other people's fields, right? if they collect tax money, usually the tax collectors would take extra and pocket it for themselves. The path to repentance is very hard because you don't remember who you collected what money from and you don't remember which fields your animals graze in. It's like and you're impossible to do tshuva. So if you do tshuva, you have to return to the ones who you know you took from. To which they say, Amre, Machzirin, Ve'emakablimahim. So, right, that was already the problem. They answer no, same thing as before. You return it, but they shouldn't accept it from you. Ve'ela, Lama Machzirin. So, they ask the same question, then why are you returning it? Well, let's say, Yedesh Shaman, right? To fulfill it, uh, for God. But then it's not so hard to do chuba. If it's just fictitious, I have to pretend to say, I will really want to return it. They say, no, it's not so hard. And the ode, and furthermore, if you don't know who to return it to, well, then use it for public, for public things like use it to dig wells, so there's water for people, use it for all sorts of things that are public. So you actually do have to spend the money. You can't say they return it to you. It's clear from here now. So the first answer we'll do today, and then we'll leave the second for tomorrow. Basically say, oh, well, the whole thing was instituted that you're not supposed to accept it from me in the time of Rabbi Yehudanasi. You could say that this Brita was before the time of Rabbi Yehudanasi, and that resolves it. Okay, so that's our first resolution to it. What well, we did, again, the beginning of the daf we already reviewed, so I'll just review from here. We took this source about saying, when you go to repent, we make it very easy for you, and you don't actually have to give back the money, to which we said in the end, well, you kind of have to give it back, but they can't accept it from you. And then we brought three sources that seem to contradict, and we resolved all of them, explaining why they don't exactly contradict. That's it for today. Wishing everybody a good week, and b'savot tovot.